So let's shift focus to the giant elephant in the room. And this is the reauthorization for the Children's Hospital's GME funding. And yes, it's true. This is my bill. And what it does is it, withhold, it withholds funding from these hospitals if they engage in what they call gender affirmation therapy, um, these physical changes to a child's physiology, permanently disfiguring them through either puberty blockers or even surgical modifications. Now, look, I understand that the other side of the argument here believes they are on the side of compassion, and maybe that's a sincerely held belief. It is just as true that I believe we are on the side of compassion. I think it is indeed compassionate to stop kids from being permanently physically altered based on little to no evidence that it will improve their underlying mental condition. Now, why is this controversial? That's actually beyond me. Not too long ago, I think we all agreed that performing double mastectomies on a 12-year-old girl was wrong. Now it's become a political movement where radical activists have bullied mainstream medical associations and members of Congress into repeating this propaganda. Now, it should be noted that in the public, this subject is actually not very controversial. In fact, a recent poll just last month by the Washington Post showed that 68% of Americans opposed using puberty blockers on children. That's just a question about puberty blockers. Imagine if the question had been about castration or surgical interventions. So you've got to convince me that 70% of Americans are just a bunch of fools that refuse to accept the so-called science. Or maybe, look, I have another theory. Maybe they have a very baseline understanding of ethics and common sense, which tells us that maybe, just maybe, it's a bad idea to submit children to permanent life-altering medical interventions based solely on a temporary ideation about their gender. Gender affirmation is not science, and there's no evidence-based standard of care. To say that is a lie, or is at best, redefining the term evidence-based. What this is, is a social contagion. It is based in pseudoscience and radical ideologies. And it's sweeping across our country and encouraging children to make irreversible changes to their gender. What's worse, it's coming from adults and institutions who know better, to include our children's hospitals. And institutions that are supposed to be tethered to sound science and their Hippocratic oath of do no harm. Now, maybe I'm an optimist, but I do believe that science and evidence will win out in the end. In the future, we will look back at these gender-affirming therapies as we now look at lobotomies and electroshock therapies. I have some reason to be hopeful. Notably, Great Britain's National Health Service restricted these clinical interventions for minors just last week. Reviews published in the British Journal of Medicine, the Journal of the Endocrine Society, even in the American Academy of Pediatrics, all cite the lack of evidence. I'm going to submit for the record this review published in the Journal of Endocrine Society that found that there is quote, low quality evidence for the idea that hormonal treatment improves quality of life, depression, and anxiety among adolescents. Now, here's the important part. This was a systematic review, which by definition is not cherry-picked data, but it's an all-encompassing review of all the data. It has thoroughly debunked the notion that any of these treatments are, quote, evidence-based, let alone recognized as, quote, standard care. My colleagues are using these terms not as accurate representations of the data, but as propaganda. Now, this funding program is reauthorized every five years. It provides taxpayer funds to train resident physicians at children's hospitals across the country. It's true. It's been a bipartisan funding mechanism for years. Let's keep in mind something, though. This is taxpayer money. And when 70% of taxpayers oppose these barbaric treatments on minors, then taxpayer money should not fund it. That's why I'm stipulating that as part of this reauthorization, we will not provide any funding through this program to children's hospitals that push gender transition on minors through puberty blockers, hormone therapies, and surgeries. Let's be clear, because there's another lie that's been told. It does not prevent any mental health therapies at all. Despite these lies being told, it does not prevent those kind of therapies at all. This is the issue of our time. This is a hill we're going to die on. Um, it's too important. It's too important to protect our, our, our kids from this. In my very limited time, um, I have too limited, too much limited time, so I'll, I'll, I'll wait for my colleagues to yield to me to, to ask questions, and I yield back. Thank you, Madam. Thank you to my colleague, and uh, I do have a few questions. You know, I, I want to say a few things first. We keep hearing this was this is a politicized uh, issue. This is a manufactured culture war. I got to say, we aren't the ones who did that. We aren't the ones that came up with this radical new movement that is performing permanent physiological changes to children with no evidence of any benefits. We we didn't start that. We're just trying to stop it because it's crazy. It's a contentious issue, which almost 70% of Americans oppose. So we are just saying here that taxpayer money shouldn't be used for it. That's all. This should not be that controversial of an issue. 
Um, the questions are for Dr. McNamara. I, I just want to ask you, honestly, you're not concerned about the unknown effects of puberty blockers, hormones, and, and surgical interventions in kids, the long-term effects, not concerned about that. Everything I've said here today comes from a place of deep honesty and conviction for the care that I provide and the community that I'm a part of. You've said that we've cherry-picked data. H how do you mean by, what, how do you mean that? So it is very unscientific and flawed to pick a single study or a single statistic and to discuss it in isolation. Um, totally agree. Medical experts are able to talk about all of the evidence as a whole. Totally agree. So it's good to look at systematic reviews, right? That's the gold standard of evidence when you're trying to understand whether something works or whether it doesn't. So the British Journal of Medicine looked at 61 systematic reviews with the conclusion that, quote, there is great uncertainty about the effects of puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and surgeries in young people. Journal of Endocrine Society came up with the same conclusion, even the American Academy of Pediatrics. They all cite the lack of evidence. And so here's the thing. If you're doing a therapy, and it's, you know, temporary, whatever, it, fine. Maybe let's try it. Let's see if it works. But when you're talking about permanent physiological changes, do you not agree, just from an ethical standpoint, that you might want extremely strong evidence of the benefits? And there is no systematic review that, that states that there is strong evidence of benefits. Sir, are you aware of how the quality evidence grading system works and how it's applied? Yeah. Yeah, we've read through it. That's why I'm citing these journals. So which journal says something different? I'm, I'm, we should have that debate. Tell me a journal that has done systematic reviews that cites different evidence, that cites strong evidence for benefits of these therapies. The standards of care were developed based on extensive... You're not telling me any journal. You're not telling me any study. Don't That's say standards not what of I'm, care. Yeah. So... Um, Tell me one. The standards of care. That's the, the standards of care. That's, yes, that's, standards that's of not care. a journal. That's not a study. That's not an organization. That's not an institution. You're just saying words. Name one study. Yeah. I'm out of time. 